The future is here already. It's just not evenly distributed. Yet. Today's world teams with innovation. The nexus of hardware, software, and human ingenuity promises a revolution in possibilities. What does tomorrow look like? Witness Future Proof. Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back once again to another episode of Future Proof. Yes, indeed, folks, your host, Eric Cavanaugh here. And uh, I have to say, I'm pretty excited right now because we are rocking and rolling with our brand new show. So what is the point here? What are we trying to do? Really, we're trying to educate our audience about most of the really interesting, compelling technologies that are redefining the world around us. So we're going to talk about software, hardware, and really human ingenuity combined to change the world, to create these powerful tools for business and for life. I'm really trying to recreate for the world what Carl Sagan did for me. And for those of you who don't remember, Carl Sagan had this fantastic show years ago in which he talked about billions and billions of stars. And he would just really get into the details of science. And Carl Sagan made science fun and interesting. And uh, I want to help recreate something like that. And even though there is no Carl Sagan today, there's no one who fills that, that void. There are really thousands of people who fill that void. And there are people at all sorts of different companies around this country and around the world, quite frankly, who are working with data, who are working with an analytics, who are building these new solutions that drive our economy, things like 5G, for example. All this cool stuff is being generated by really interesting people. And our job at Future Proof is to find those people and to have them present and share their ideas with you on the show. I'm going to talk a little bit about edge computing, and it is not something you probably worry about today, but you will worry about tomorrow. And I think there's already enough buzz around it, and let's try to demystify this some. What is edge computing beyond the buzzword? Let me give you a simple example. So let's say that you went to a, you heard about a great cafe, you know, this, we call it the app cafe. You go with a friend, and you hear, you read the menu, wow, this looks like amazing food. Um, the server's there, takes your order. Wow, let's get some food. Well, all of a sudden you see your server driving off in a car or a delivery van. And you're like, what is going on here? Why is this person leaving? Well, the reason they're leaving is because the kitchen for that cafe is actually farther away. And that's Cloud Kitchen. And so the server is then delivering the order to the kitchen. The kitchen then spends the time to make it and then puts it into the delivery van and sends back with the wait staff. Wait a minute, I ordered soup, not a salad. Oh, no problem, I'll go get it. If you actually went to a restaurant or a cafe and you saw this happening, I'll bet you're probably not gonna leave a very good Yelp review. Edge computing, distributed computing, yay. But it's this whole thing about computation and data storage, and the, the key here is closer to the location where it's needed. And that, I think, makes sense in a lot of people's minds because, going back to our restaurant analogy, edge computing is like having a kitchen in every restaurant, which sounds really obvious. But we don't build our computer network and how we do applications like that right now. So what's driving this new future? Networks have become a lot more ubiquitous, and the capacity is becoming more ubiquitous. This is a good example of like, well, now we have the potential, when Starlink finishes, we'll have the potential of having good quality high-speed networking in any location on the planet, mostly. This is the future, and this is, this is something we have to think about. And there are other efforts as well. Um, I think Facebook and Google have all been trying to figure out how to put um, to gain access to new markets based on ubiquity net of networking. It opens up the door for a whole new audience, but it also gives a better high-speed internet connection to someone who may not even have an internet connection. 5G, again, is not, not revolutionary, it's evolutionary. And what 5G is um, supposed to be trying to address is if you look at the, the networking, the data networking that is attached to the cell phone networks, it was really an afterthought. 5G took that from the beginning and said, you know, data is the first class. And so it's addressing things like latency. Talk to anyone in the cell phone industry. This is it. This is what they're all working towards right now. It's comp 
compute capacity has changed. And this is just Moore's law, but we're putting more compute capacity closer to everyone. It isn't all just centralized, the biggest clouds, for instance. It's easier to get compute capacity anywhere you need it. We have enormous amount of workloads coming that just will not be okay with centralized computing. Um, a good example is, of course, uh, intelligent roadways, self-driving cars, the thing that's turning into the fusion thing is like it's 20 years away. But it's not. Networks need to be closer. The data needs to be closer. And these workloads need to have really, really low latency. And we'll cover that in a minute. Why is edge computing even becoming a buzzword? It covered these things that were like, look, here are eight things that everyone thinks is true and get you in trouble. Let's focus on just four of those. <clears throat> And that is the network is reliable, <laughs> the latency is zero, bandwidth is infinite, and transport cost is zero. In the world of distributed computing, these are easy assumptions to make. It is, well, if I connect up my Ethernet cable or hook up my Wi-Fi, then everything is instant. Not, it's instant-ish. My power went out. And what does that mean? Well, I lost my Wi-Fi immediately. Just knowing that the network isn't reliable, I'm not gonna count on the fact that only thing I can ever use ever is my Wi-Fi. We live on a big planet. It's kind of huge. And when we talk about the speed of light, is isn't instantaneous. And at large distances, it can actually add up quite a bit. Now, this is showing you to go around the Earth in a vacuum, it still takes light 133 milliseconds to go all the way around the Earth. It does introduce some latency and you can't beat that. We made it worse. We transmit a lot of our stuff over copper and fiber. And the reality is based on physics, 70% of that, you get about 70% of the actual speed of light from that. And with networks and being able to relay and routing and all those things, it's double. So that means around the world is actually 266 milliseconds, which is a quarter of a second. These are things that when they add up, they start making some really bad things and you can't beat it. When someone is communicating with a central application and they're talking to that application code, we have a few things here. The law that we should think about is like, the greater the latency, you're gonna get less user, user satisfaction. Less user satisfaction means less dollars. In terms of mission critical applications like medical or self-driving cars, logistics, that sort of thing, um, that greater latency could actually be deadly. Uh, that needs to happen in single digit milliseconds. And going to cloud provider, like running in an Amazon container somewhere and coming back and saying, yeah, you're totally going to get into an accident. Hold on. By then, I probably have had that accident. And at that point, I'm going to be asking for help. Thanks, cloud. Now, that means the central computation and data storage paradigm is now super challenged. If I have a San Francisco user versus someone who's like in say, Sao Paulo, Bangalore, London. Where's the central point in that? At some point, someone's not going to be very happy. And that just doesn't work anymore. The only way to beat the speed of light is to just accept it and get things closer. And this is where edge computing is really showing its promise. A San Francisco user has local computation and data storage, and so as a Bangalore user, they're going to have a pretty similar experience because now they're dealing with a sub 10 millisecond latency. Regulatory issues now are by government to government. Yes, we can create pipes and we can route data from one point to the other, or maybe not, but there's going to be rules on that data. And in some cases, those rules are things that can not just get you in trouble, but completely shut you down. Working around regulatory issues is really about edge computing at this point. This is the next thing beyond cloud. We went from on-prem to cloud. We're gonna go from cloud to edge. If you look at companies like NVIDIA, they're not just selling graphics cards anymore. They're trying to figure out how to embed like a high bit of computing, so parallel computing inside of a car or what it needs to do to do a self-driving car. If you have a global business, your data has to be global. Reliability is um, an important part of whenever you do distributed data storage and how you make this ubiquity of your application. Um, you cannot survive in a world like, you know, I was just mentioning before, it's like only thing I was expecting is Wi-Fi. My only users in the world are gonna be local to my San Francisco office 
and be running Wi-Fi or, you know, that is a bad assumption. And reliability is really built around this idea. It's like I can have these problems that come up. For instance, a partition problem. Now, this is terminology that we use inside of distributed computing, but being partition tolerant also known as a split, uh, split brain problem. And the split brain means that I have a common set of data that's being spread across multiple geographic locations. And one of those geographic locations becomes isolated from the other. We talk about the CAP theorem, uh, consistency, availability, and partition. And most databases are good at consistency and availability, but not good at partition tolerance. Cassandra is really good at partition tolerance, and why? Because this is a real world problem. Things happen all the time. Being partition tolerant is really, it's a superpower. But it's also very, very difficult from a computer science standpoint. The future that I see here in this, what we're building, is I want to build data systems that can not only be terrestrial, but extraterrestrial. So um, taking these networks into, as we start progressing into space and doing space industries, such as asteroid mining and working on the moon, data systems have to be tolerant for those kind of eventual consistencies and partition changes and putting the data locally. So this is the future that we have to have as these things happen in the future. Flexibility is already built into computing, but what's interesting to me is that we've built in the flexibility in a very centralized fashion. Well, um, something happens, in, you know, where Brazil is doing awesome. Well, that means that there might be a lot of extra traffic if people are watching the game, they're talking about it, things are happening, people are ordering whatever food. That, I mean, these things are just going on. Well, that's a local problem. You should be able to scale that. Well, as it turns out, um, the UK is really not doing well, and everyone just went offline. They don't care anymore. They're just sorry, and they're just going to go lay in bed. All right, great. I should be able to scale down. So from a cost perspective, saying, you know, your local compute and data is kind of re reflects what's happening locally, lets you do more spot pricing where you need it instead of having a universal price where like, well, if someone in if Sao Paulo goes crazy and London doesn't, well, I'm going to pay the crazy price because I have to maintain it. Distributed computing is about this, you know, being able to, I'm using Cassandra as an as a example here because it's a lot, it allows you to spread your data all over the place. But the final point that I want to make here is about federation. And this is really responding to the, just the world geopolitics. Um, like, for instance, in Brazil, they have LGPD, which is their version of GDPR. Uh, Four-letter acronyms are the way we do data security now. But it's the same as GDPR, of course, is in Europe and the EU, where you know, there's just this data protection. What do we say? to companies who want to do business with data. And there are rules, like what data can stay in Europe and what can leave Europe. What data can you bring in? What can you bring out? Edge computing requires that level of knowledge about where it's at. It has to be smart enough. Um, you know, and this is something in mean, the Apache project that we're really, the Cassandra project that we're really concerned about because if you're going to spread your data everywhere, you could get somebody in big trouble if, you can't share personal information over this boundary, this imaginary boundary in, that's on a map somewhere. Um, you may get fined heavily by a government. Uh, federation is a really big deal in this case um, and something that's really important for edge computing and something we should all, you know, this is something we're all working towards and trying to pay attention. This is the future. Data is federated, data is distributed. I am done. Um, Hopefully I've convinced you that, you know, that edge computing is just not a buzzword. It's not something that comes and goes. It's, uh, this is not buzzword bingo. This is a reality. It will affect your future and you will be doing it. Wow, uh, Patrick, you brought up so many interesting points there. I'm just processing. I couldn't even type down all the quotables. I love the line about uh, you're not going to get a ticket from Einstein, and you have to accept the reality. Let's let's kind of dive into some of these different topics. So you talked about how we went from on-prem to cloud. I often joke that it took about two weeks to go from talking hybrid cloud to talking multi-cloud, because multi-cloud is right. the reality. 
there's no going back. I don't think there's any doubt about it. You won't see acquisitions at the scale that are going to stop that. You already have three major forces in in the cloud. Amazon, of course, is still the leader. Microsoft is nipping at their heels. But Google is getting very serious as well, not just from acquisitions, but they, they seem to finally have it in their heads that they want a big piece of that enterprise market. But you brought up a lot of very, very interesting points here. And I, I'd like you to talk about this impact of going from, first you said, of course, on-prem to cloud, then from cloud to the edge. And it's a very interesting dynamic because you know, if you think of this in terms of client server, which is where we were in the on-prem world, in post-mainframe, basically, you had lots of servers and you had a bunch of different uh, endpoint clients, but they got pretty fat, right? You had your nice big box and if you're a user, you were using some powerful technologies. Well, now we're going, we go to the cloud through, you know, some, some decent boxes still that are at, at the endpoints by the users, up to the cloud, and then out to the edge, which is everywhere. To, to your point, you're talking tens of millions of devices, maybe even more. That just opens up all these different architectural questions to be asked. And I think the underlying point you're making here is that an approach like Cassandra, Apache Cassandra, which of course is the engine that DataStax focuses on, it enables you to solve that data challenge, which is going to be very real and very significant. Is that about right? Yeah, you can you can deploy um, like the, the the logic tier pretty easily, and it's actually there's, this is looking at adjacent technologies that make this happen. Um, like for instance, Kubernetes is a really, uh, I think, a strong contender of how we will do edge effectively, and um, because that's you know that's about deploying infrastructure and deploying your architectures in flexible ways. Um, but deploying a web server is a lot different from deploying a web server is just going to communicate with the endpoint, you know, create, creates APIs. But deploying a data system, like I said, a, a data system can get you fined, and you're making decisions on a lot of, I think, more mission critical issues there. Yeah, you brought up Kubernetes. So for the broader audience out there, let's unpack that a little bit. Absolutely fascinating move, especially in the evolution of open source. And we're going to talk a lot about open source in this show, Future Proof, because it really is changing how business gets done. And it's allowing companies to focus on what makes them special. So, you know, we talked about uh, reinventing wheels on many occasions during uh, these various shows. And you've seen that as a developer out there in the real world, companies are forever reinventing wheels. Well, when the open source movement comes into full force, there is theoretically a good bit left of that, right? And so Google comes along and uh, sees what Docker had done, creates Kubernetes, and it's become a de facto standard of distributed compute, basically. You're allowing the distribution of compute by these containers. Can you explain to our audience uh, in, at a high level how that works, why that's so significant, especially in the multi-cloud world, and why data, to your point, is still a separate issue to be solved. Can you talk about that? Well, Kubernetes, as it says here, is, is, is orchestration. But orchestrating what? And orchestration being like making sure the things that you want to happen are happening. Um, so if you, if you go back in time and look at uh, just the evolution of how we deployed applications, um, we used to just deploy a server that ran a bunch of programs. And those individual programs on a server, um, can, you know, they constituted your entire application. Think back at the LAMP server. And eventually, as we started to outscale that, we started looking at, all right, how do I run my application, like, in multiple processes across multiple servers? And that became pretty unwieldy. And that was around the time that containers became very popular. And containers are essentially, like, um, a tight little package, like a little dumpling of your application that has everything you need and it's all wrapped up into a neat little bite-sized chunk. And yes, that's right. I called it infrastructure dumplings. And, um, <laughs> but it, it, it's, that's what it is. Um, you know, the, you have everything you need for that. Let's say that you're running a web server. Okay. Everything to run that web server, including the operating system and all the system calls that it needs to make are in that 
container. Um, and running containers and Docker, this is where Docker came from, uh, was how do I run a container? Well, once you get into that world, here we go, is uh, now Docker created this great way to deploy an application, but now I have a lot of containers. So Kubernetes, of course, came along and said, I got a solution for this. And this is where we are in the world. Instead of deploying individual applications, we're deploying containers, so they're not neat, neat and compact, but Kubernetes is the one connecting the dots. And what's really cool about what Kubernetes is doing is it's building out all the, the connective tissue in an application. So when I build an application from top down, there's things like networking and security and um, persistence and storage, and all those things are managed inside of Kubernetes. And I can, de I can define my deployment and say, I need it to look like this all the time boof out into the cluster and you can run it across multiple servers and it does really interesting things like it knows I, I have to run all these containers separately or together or I can make this really large server run efficiently. Um, so it's, it's creating this place where we can do things with confidence and, and reproducing it. The, the next wow. gen future where it's happening is with data because data was one of the is now just being figured out in Kubernetes world. And that's pretty exciting. Wow, that's interesting. I don't even know that. <laughs> so I learned something new right there. This is why we have the show. Uh, Patrick, if you would also <laughs> talk about because the thing that gets me so excited about Kubernetes and about this approach, first of all, it's open source. Kudos to everyone who commits to open source projects and folks, if you're out there, kids, young, teenage, boys and girls, and you're wondering, what am I going to do with my career? What am I going to do in the real world? Focus on code. If you find it interesting, it's a fantastic career. Coders are never going away, I promise you, no matter what they, they tell you in the movies about AI, etc. If you learn to code, at least for a while, you can then be a liaison to the business. There are lots of things you can do besides coding. It's like the law. If you learn the law, one of the newest trends I see is people getting law degrees and then doing something else. So doing some business mm. or doing some marketing thing, but they know the law. And so it's a foundation for them and for their career. And I say the same is true for code. But Patrick, what fascinates me, not just that it's open source, but the problem they're solving is, is this world that you're talking about, this incredibly diverse topographical environment, both in terms of technology and culture and business model, et cetera, the whole amazing web that we're weaving. Kubernetes allows us to distribute the compute that gets things done, and they decided in such a way as to more or less obviate the operating system. Because if you think about the OS and how the OS changes, you've got, of course, Mac with its OS, you've got Samsung and these other entities that are using their own operating system. Well, Kubernetes kind of obviates that as a problem, which to me, it's just opening the floodgates to future innovation. Can you kind of talk about that for a minute and how that works? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's re this, this concept of reducing the toil. You know, I, I, I love that. It sounds so, so cool when you say that, reducing the toil. The toil is like just having to do a lot of work to make anything work. And I, you know, I, I, my background is in infrastructure. I've made a career around toil. Um, but, I think that if you look at from a business standpoint, uh, you're you're not going to get. I mean, efficiency is always an, an important metric, right? And when you have, um, if you have 25 steps to get your product out the door and, and start extracting value, and then you learn a way to make it two steps, you probably should take the second because um, you're going to. You, you mentioned, you know, you should learn how to code. Absolutely, because that is the future um if if someone if, if a company hires a computer scientist or a developer doesn't even have to be someone with a computer science degree someone who can develop code can articulate they're wanting they want to see someone who can help them create value in the company not someone who knows how to do some really crazy things with infrastructure and those days are coming to a close and i'm fine with that and things like kubernetes are now allowing us to codify <clears throat> the harder parts into something a little more deployable. And 
so what's the next thing? Well, <laughs> it doesn't seem like we always get rid of like hard things, but we're moving the ball. Now, instead of me learning how to patch a Linux server, um, I'm trying to figure out how to make sure that my, my Node.js and React application work really well in the real world. And I can have, uh, I can scale that up so that I have millions of users. Um, that's more valuable to my company, you know, if I'm working in application tier, than making sure my Linux servers are running. That's just not as interesting. Well, and that's, that's an excellent point that you make. And you're reminding me to tease our next episode with data stacks in which we're going to talk about getting in the, the, getting in the zone, basically. And this is very interesting stuff, folks, because you all know it. Everybody who is a worker, a practitioner, a musician, anything, knows what it means to kind of get into a groove. In music, in particular, we talk a lot about that because there's a certain cadence to it. Um, you orchestrate the instruments around a tune. And there's an energy to it. And that's the thing. There is an energy to it. There's a chi, as the, as the Chinese would call it. And that's a very powerful thing. And when that energy is humming in a, in a good fashion, when you're in tune, so to speak, and you're in the flow, you're in the zone, it's like Zen. We talk about Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance, for example, that classic book. But in the world of coding, and I have a lot of friends who are coders, I can tell you it's very interesting because in a way it, it is pretty dry. I mean, you're literally hacking out code, but the, the tools are getting better and better for how you get it all to work. I mean, the orchestration side of that is just is mind blowing, quite frankly. And if you want to go to a show, go to Cubeflow. Once the conferences come back, and they will go to Cubeflow. But uh, if you would, let's tease our audience a bit, Patrick, because you got me excited about this as a concept about getting into the zone. I'm a writer. I'm a musician. I know what it means to get into a flow and to do things, a performer. And it's very powerful. And if you can harness that and learn how to Tease it out of you. It's like getting the muse on your side in the world of creativity. Because code is not, it's not just characters. It's functionality. There's an art to it. There's a science to it. It's really quite fascinating how rich and complex that world is. After is our, is our attempt at reducing the toil for sure. I mean, we know that Cassandra is not an easy database to use because it's distributed databases in general are require a different kind of sophistication. But um, you know, this is this is what we know is that Cassandra is well regarded as one of the most powerful databases in the world, but it's super hard to use. So if you've got to use it, you know, you got to know that. Well, Astra is what we're looking what we're looking at with Astra is like we should eliminate all of the concepts that you have to to really load yourself up with, like understanding how a distributed database even works. So Astra is just when you want a database, a Cassandra database, you log in, give it a name, click start, and it will start a database for you. Everything that happens underneath, you don't need to know about. It's, it's, it's not your problem. It's someone else's problem, and you're renting it. Wow. Folks, so there's a whole new fascinating future unfurling before our very eyes. And big thanks to you, Patrick, and to Datastack and the whole open source community for creating these new powerful foundations. Check out this uh, Datastack website for more information about what's going on. It's a big, big deal, folks. It is the future. We'll talk to you soon, Patrick. Thank you so much for your time. We'll catch up to you next time, folks. Take care. Bye-bye. Hop online to insideanalysis.com for more information. That's where we'll post the archive. And folks, we want to know what you want to know. So if you have any thoughts about all this, send me an email, info at insideanalysis.com. That comes straight to me. And like I say, we're keen to understand what your impressions are. We want to know what you want to know. Send me an email, info at insideanalysis.com. With that, we're going to bid you farewell, folks. We'll talk to you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.